Racist alert, racist alert. This is a bit where you start uh, saying all that Michael Corrin. He's a terrible racist, isn't he? Uh, couldn't care less. Have to say this. Whenever we hear about uh, Canadians or, or, or Brits or Swedes or Danes who are parts of, of Islamic terror groups, I always cringe rather because, look, I, I don't care where you were born or really what your attitudes are, but if you're a Canadian, you have a, a loyalty to Canada. You may criticize aspects of its governance, that's fine, but you love the country. And there are people who claim to be or are described as being British or Canadian or Scandinavian and commit acts of terror. And when you look into them, they may be the accident of citizenship. And I'll use that phrase again, if you like, the accident of citizenship. They were born in a certain country or they managed to have that citizenship tenuously, tentatively. But their actions dictate that they have hatred, if anything, for that nation, for that Western nation. And I say this because just today we found out that it seems at least that two Al-Qaeda members who were found dead in Algeria were Canadian. David Harris, a former CSIS officer from uh, Insignia Strategic Research, joins us now from Ottawa. Welcome to you, David. Hello, Michael. Uh, Canadian? Well, it may depend how we define Canadian. You've indicated that there are now certain variations on the theme that even embrace some of our arch enemies. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, it's come to that in part, I suppose, through uh, the um, incredibly generous way in which we seem to distribute citizenships and welcome people to the country. A quarter of a million people who came in last year in the immigration stream alone, well over 500,000 if you include temporary uh, visa type holders. How you are possibly able to uh, meaningfully screen those kinds of numbers is, I think, an increasing mystery to a good many people on the security side. Whether or not that is a partial explanation for what we're seeing in Algeria today, of course, remains an issue. Mm. If, however, they have Canadian passports, Canada's an internationally respected country, if they can travel quite easily, then they're, they're, they're perfect recruiting fodder for, Isla for Islamic terror groups. They could well be. Uh, Canada, as you've said, is a, a reputable nation, or at least it has been traditionally. But 15 years ago, we were getting some pretty serious warnings, you might remember, from the then director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, who, in testimony before a Canadian Senate committee, warned that Canada had more terrorist organizations on its soil than perhaps any other country in the world, with the possible exception of the United States. Wow. Maybe we are now seeing a kind of logical development in this. It's not that it's by any means the first time that we've had Canadian citizens involved in efforts hostile to the Canadian interest or security. Mm -hmm. How do we even begin to deal with this sort of challenge? And we have to say that the vast majority of people who come to Canada, irrespective of their, of their religion, uh, love this country. It's not for me to say whether they should live in certain communities or, or act in a particular way. I mean, that, that's not the issue. The, the issue is actually fighting a war against this country. And there are some people, let's be direct here, in, in the Islamic community who feel no empathy or sympathy with Canada, and a small number of whom, it seems to be in this case, who will actually take up arms against us and our interests and our allies. Well, of course, we've been warned for years by any number of moderate Muslim Canadians that this is the very case. Indeed, these Canadians have been rather galvanized by the situation because they feel themselves, certainly the ones with whom I've been speaking, uh, being outflanked by the sheer numbers of folk representing ideologies hostile to this country. We saw how, you well remember, in December, we had the Reviving the Islamic Spirit Conference, yep. which of course had been peppered in the past by people who'd be politely considered as radical. Well, the question surely is presenting itself to Canadians. How is it that it's possible with that kind of history to find tens of thousands of people to attend such an event and not instead to come out protesting it? Uh, how is it that, of course, we find a significant politician or two? In fact, pretty well all of the Canadian political parties at one time or another represented bringing greetings to such a gathering. Uh, these things are warnings to us all, and they represent uh, an increase in the general level of the appetite for some forms of radicalism, including Islamic extremism, within our own neighborhoods and communities. Mm -hmm. And we know that in the case of Algeria and elsewhere, that Islamic fanatics sometimes have a certain degree of subtlety. They will find employment with Western-owned organizations, institutions, and at some point then open up with terror. Well, that's it. And indeed, if you go to the 
manual of terror called, I think, the management of savagery, uh, the Al-Qaeda folk are not given to understatement, put out by uh, Abu Bakr Naji a few years ago, he addressed himself to this. He said that the priority of Al-Qaeda should be, among others, the infiltrating and penetrating of the infrastructures mm. of opposing governments. And in light of the Algerian situation, it's very interesting to see if I can quote from it. I'll be very quick, like about 10 seconds. He said, we should infiltrate the police forces, armies, <laughs> different political parties, the newspapers, the Islamic groups, the petroleum companies as an oh. employer or as an engineer, private security companies, the very <sighs> entities rising in this context. And they are of their word, are they not? Uh, they are indeed. You'll be back on the show very soon. Uh, we have to have you and we enjoy always having you on the show. Thank you, my friend. Take care, Michael.